Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Sean McAllister, and I'm a volunteer with the uh, South African Film Festival. Um, all proceeds from this festival are going to go to Education Without Borders, which provides educational opportunities for disadvantaged learners in South Africa. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Lars Kroma, uh, the writer and director of Measures of Men. So welcome, Lars. Hi, Sean. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. Thank you very much for asking. Good, good. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so I thought we could start by talking a little bit about some of the historical contexts for uh, Measures of Men. So your film, of course, tells part of the story of the early 20th century uh, Herero and Nama genocides um, by the German Empire uh, in, the, in the country that's now Namibia. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how well known these atrocities are in Germany today. Um, and, and if you have a sense, like in, in the larger world, because my sense is that um, pe people don't know much about these um, th these events, these atrocities. No, no, you're absolutely right. There is, a, um, I would even call it a, like a general amnesia in Germany towards um, all atrocities that uh, that happened during um imperialism and you know colonialism and all and that has to do with the fact that germany lost all its colonies in um, 1919 after the the loss of world war one um and after they, they lost the war they had to to give up all the uh, colonies and and that then happened you know th then came the the third reich and the and in 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 the last 70 years, basically, all, you know, the collective German memory of our past is all towards the atrocities that happened during the Nazi regime. And and when the big um, wars, you know, the, the, the um, decolonization wars like Vietnam or um, uh, um, um, the Falkland War, whatever, you, know, you name it, all over the world happened, it was easy for the Germans to point towards other European countries and say, if you all had these problems um, with the, with colonial times, so we don't have this. Right, right. right. So there's like an there's like a general amnesia, and I think, you know, basically what we can really say is that um, in, all over Europe, at least in the last mm, six or eight years. There has been a, um, a constant rising awareness of um, of colonial past. The um, the um, discussion about the um, um, stolen artifacts from from yeah. South uh, yeah. Sub-Saharan yeah. Africa and the you know the return of those artifacts that have been discussed uh, in the context of uh, ethnological collections that has um, brought an awareness to a certain group of of people at least who you know who take care of these things and even and and today there has been uh, uh, on the news um our president uh, um asked for apologies um in east in former east africa um uh, con uh, um dealing with the um uh, maji maji uprise that was uh, approximately 300,000 people died there and our uh, president today asked for apologies there so that that was interesting for me to hear today hmm. those things uh, you know, um, are more in the news now, but they have, mm. nevertheless, if you go out on the street and you ask 10 people, nine of them would probably not know anything about any colonial times in Germany. Mm -hmm, right. I mean, it's interesting to me that you sort of uh, observe this sort of sp split in uh, German consciousness before and after 1919, as if uh, uh, that's that sort of belongs to a different time, a different country. But Scholars talk about how um, the the Herero and uh, Nama genocides sort of, in in some ways, represent a kind of starting point for the Holocaust. That you can draw a straight line between them in terms of um, not not just race, racist ideologies, racial science, but also um, techniques, concentration camps, and so on. Yes, right. There, there. <laughs> even if you look at the personnel, like. Um... Uh, Göring's father was uh, right, was one yes. of the early early uh, um, uh, men sent there by the by the emperor, and so, so you see a lot of uh, um, of people who who were in the in the army in in those days in Germany's southwest, and then later played a role in the Nazi regime. Mm. Yes, the uh, the idea of the concentration camps um, sort of was born in the southern. 
southern part of Africa. I think the, the in the Boer War, the the British had these English kind of helped things. along with that as well. Even right, before yeah. the Germans had, but nevertheless, they they imported those ideas from there. And of course, these the, what the film deals with the the measure measuring of of skulls and 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 the pseudo scientific um, approaches to define race. Those things have been in a continuity to what. Mm -hmm. The Nazi regime, the Nazis were, you know, measuring skulls all over the world again. And so yes, there some of these ideas were born there. But of course, it's not something these genocides should never be compared. Of course, there is a, there's a huge um difference, uh, of course, again, between the um, between the Holocaust and all that all the terror that the Nazi regime has then come up with and those early attempts of it of this genocide in 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 namibia yeah. nevertheless it's i mean that's one of the reasons why we made this film in the first place is that it's a it's a shame that germany has not asked for apologies yet that the german parliament has not um named it a, a genocide really they they name it a genocide under contemporary um um, point of view, so to say, and you know, and in in our days, it would be a genocide, not in those days. So that is just a a term to avoid any kind of payment, mm, and there sure, has been sure. a long negotiation process, but that hasn't come to an end. And of course, we still have these artifacts in these human mm. remains in Germany. They have not been fully restored and uh, given back. So those three points: an apology. A reparation and the the return of all the human remains you know those would be the the central things that i think would be absolutely should have happened by now sure yeah absolutely um maybe building on your um comments about this racist pseudoscience i wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh that context um it's obviously a very important context for your film you begin the movie and you end the movie in the lecture halls and the sort of uh, ethnology labs um, of of Germany before your um, your your main character. I don't want to call him a protagonist, but your main character uh, defines himself in Africa. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about that uh, that context? Why you decided that it was going to be an important context for your film? Why you were going to um, begin and end your movie like this? Um, and maybe also, if if you wouldn't mind, this is of personal interest to me, but can you tell me a little bit about your research process, um, what you read, what sources you consulted, um, uh, and so on? Well, the um, I, then I start with the research process. I I um, I started out uh, um, with the idea to to adopt one of the few novels german novels that exist um, um that deal with this time um, um and it's called um, morenga written by uwe tim in the late 70s and it um it had been made for to uh, turned into a um, tv series mini series not very uh, successfully yeah. very long and and the, but the, the the novel nevertheless is is very interesting and i found it and i thought it would be time to to take a new look on this time of racism and colonialism and um, and as i said it's one of the two more or less fiction novels that uh, that are dealing with this at all and there's been really no feature film so starting out from that um novel um i i wrote a screenplay that was then very much um, a war movie, a soldier's tale. And and if you do that, of course, you are in the midst of combat and you have all these kind of scenes where people are um, fighting. And that means white violence against black people. Mm -hmm. And um, with when the screenplay was finished, I thought that is too much uh, graphic violence that is too explicit and uh, it's re-traumatizing and we don't want to do that. So. I told my producer and Uwe Tim, the writer of the novel, who was really happy that we were, you know, making a new film from his uh, old novel. I told him, well, I have to leave this and I have to find my own 
story. Okay, interesting. And then I and then I and then as I said, there was this discussion, um, this discussion coming in Europe uh, with the um, um, reparation and and the returns of the artifacts and all of that and. And it, it's it's in the in the focus were those um, uh, bronze statues from Nigeria um, and and Emmanuel Macron had had the French president had made this a centerpiece of his first election campaign and and that gave a huge push towards this whole topic and I and I felt that there was a an an audience also um, um, grow, growing uh, you know. Dealing with these questions of of ethnologists ethnologists at that time, and I have apart from Indiana Jones, who's not an ethnologist but but and a very different <laughs> character, but but you know there is there is no film that I would know of um, that deals with this interesting question of this mm. young scientific um, uh, field of ethnology. At it was only created in the mid nineteenth century. And um, and as um, people were able to travel all over the world, and you know, technical development gave them the possibility to 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 study all these cultures. Um, it was very interesting to to put one of these characters in the center. And one of them, I, you know, you read many books when you when you write on a screenplay like that, and of course you talk to people and. And all of that. One of the interesting books that I read in, on the dilemma of the German ethnologists at that time um, was written by a man called H. Glenn Penny, and it really deals with these early days of German uh, ethnological um, collections, um, especially the um, Ethnological Museum in Berlin. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> and when you read that, you can you can see that there, that there is this dilemma that there are um, that there are people um, following Darwin's theory of evolutionism and and others following this idea of diffusionism. It's a it's just like one of the discussion that they have: Are we one uh, race? Uh, all human, all humans, one race, or are there different races? Sorry, that's my son, <laughs> and um, and. Um, yeah, so I, well, I my interest grew in these in this in this dilemma of the ethnologists, and let me explain the dilemma. The dilemma here is that these people, of course, were interested in all kind of cultures. They were traveling the world to study all kind of cultures, and at the same time, they knew that just by traveling there and and studying different cultures, they would also destroy them. Mm -hmm. And and of course, the um, they were always dealing with um, soldiers and um, and and um, um, traders and and all these people that were trying trying to exploit these these other cultures, missionaries trying to Christianize them, and and all this this whole system of of colonialism was was of course interesting to me, and I thought this this point of view of the ethnologist might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Because um, you said you wouldn't call him a protagonist, I would call him a protagonist because he is good and evil. I mean, there is mm -hmm. something yeah. good driving him, and there's also something very evil driving him. Um, the good thing is he he believes in in this idea of one human race in the beginning, one and then one and then during his you know his journey, he he realizes that imperial powers and that the will of the of this of the emperor and you know to to oppress all kind of rebellion you know, it's so strong and that it's and that this empire is so dark that um that there's no way for him that it's naive to believe that he could make a difference so he becomes a morally corrupt character right, right. but this good and evil in 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 him is of course a very i think it's in every person and um, and uh, yeah, so this is how this whole came story came together. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think your your movie does a great job of showing um, how ethnology becomes not just part of the colonial system, but a very important sort of apparatus for justifying it as well. And it becomes a sort of self fulfilling prophecy where um, the, the the races become uh, hierarchized. And the destruction of a particular group or a particular culture, um, it, it's almost like it's prophesied um, 
by these racist ideas. Um, so I, I think your 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 movie for me did a really good job of bringing those two things together. Um, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit more, but maybe before we jump into the movie, could I ask you a little bit about um, uh, taking your film on the road and screening it in Namibia? Um, oh yeah, uh, that, that was uh, yeah. Maybe you can ex you can explain that experience to us a little bit. <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks for asking because that was really a, a, the greatest journey I ever I ever did with a film was was this journey. We we had premiere on the Berlinale Film Festival in February. That was a world premiere. Of course, these A festivals asked for world premiere. Um, so, but then, so we, we showed it there, but then the producer and I said, okay, but the first thing we do before it is shown anywhere else, especially in Germany, it has, to, it needs to be shown in Namibia. And especially because it deals, it's really two wars that were fought there, the war against the Herero and the war against the Nama. And so we, and the film deals more with the Herero genocide. Um, and then we said, okay, we have to travel through the Herero, traditional Herero um, areas and show it there. And of course there are no cinemas. So we brought in a, um, a great um, team, NGO, uh, young people from South Africa called Sunshine Cinema. And they, and, and these people from Sunshine Cinema, they, they projected, they had a, they had a, um, a Jeep with a projector and a, and a portable uh, screen. And so, so we traveled to these little communities and screened it at night, open air. And, um, and that was very emotional for, for the Herero people to watch this film and they knew what was coming. They knew that, that, that it would be a film about the genocide told from a perpetrator's perspective from a German director and so on. And, and we would, would be there and, and talk to the people. And then um, every night we would have these screenings and people would react very, as I said, very emotional, very different. And they, and, and, and it was, a, um, and it was interesting conversations that we had and, many people had known the genocide stories only from um, oral um, storytelling. So they, they wouldn't, there are not really many photographs or anything of that time. So the film really helped them to fill a, a kind of a void that they had, that uh, what it would maybe would have looked like when the Germans did all these atrocities. So now they could see the film and they could, um, and they could share their uh, family stories that they had. Um, and one thing, I mean, the most emotional thing that that you can experience there is is, is this: there, there's one aspect in the film that, as I said, we we try to reduce too much violence, we try to avoid too much violence. And and one thing that the Germans also did, like probably every army in the world always does, is mass rapings. And these mass rapings that that led to um, to children um, mm -hmm. of, of lighter skin complexions, and those um, those people would, you know, would uh, I remember one man like maybe in his early thirties would come up to me after screening and was very emotional and said, you know, look at me, I'm half, you know, half of me is German, half is Namibian. I I don't belong to the Herero, I don't belong to the Germans, and and he was really frustrated that this whole topic was really not something people would talk about people don't you know he can hardly travel to germany he wouldn't get a, a visa to travel to germany but he would neither belong really to the Herero community so those those encounters were really very emotional and um and of course then the there were uh, uh, politicians Herero politicians who said that you know this film is a weapon uh, show it to all the germans because they 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 are so ignorant about the genocide yeah, that was a very interesting, very emotional and interesting journey to show the film there. That's fascinating. It, it makes me think a little bit about uh, Martin Scorsese's new movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. And yes, uh, I haven't seen that one. I'm very I curious. I'm very excited to watch it. But uh, it, uh, I've, I've read some reviews where especially people from uh, the Osage uh, Indigenous group have uh, similar sort of strong strong reactions um ambivalent but strong some people saying this is you know I, i've never seen my grandparents or my great grandparents stories you know on on screen of course but it represented be, be seen people interested in them um and then other people saying you know this was very difficult for me to watch i i don't want to see this i don't want it to be sort of 
shared. Um, so I wonder, I wonder if, um, if, if that was something you were worried about, were you, were you like mm -hmm. going into these screenings? Did you feel anxious about, um, well, to be honest, you know, I was there with, um, <clears throat> with Anna Scheicher, my main uh, actor, uh, and Gurley Jazama, the, mm -hmm. the hero actress, and, um, and in the and people were very nervous. Um, not so much Girly Leo and I, but um, the people who organized all the mm. you know all the journeys and and who who spoke to the uh, um, elders of the community and beforehand. And because people had no hadn't seen the film, it was really always a, a kind of a moment of premiere. The, the audience and and the uh, you know seeing the film and their reactions. Uh, and of and we were in very um, sacred places, and some mm. of these places were were really uh, important to the Herero community and culture. So yes, there was kind of they were nervous. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 the first screening was in Katatura and Vintuk, um, which is the biggest township in Vintuk, and they and 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 there were the many of the there was uh, the um, uh, um, the paramount chief of the Herero was there and and. And I know that this first evening was that everybody was very happy that nothing happened because mm -hmm. no one, you know, would someone attack me as a director or someone be so angry that you, know, mm -hmm. you never know. Yes, um, but it, it was that was really not the point. There mm -hmm. was no question. There was always more the desire to talk and to to share these stories. We had someone with us. Um, a psychologist who uh, from the Herero community who deals with um, intergenerational trauma and and people could also talk to her. Sometimes she would even go on the next day and visit some of the people who were very emotional during the screenings. And so, so the whole process was taken care of in a way that you would say that's the best. We tried our best to really mm -hmm. get to the conversation, um, but but that's what I mean when I say it was the most intense journey I ever had with the movie. Yeah. It, imagine it is not, not comparable to any kind of um other screening i ever had your typical because... red carpet yeah yeah <laughs> that, oh, wow. that, uh, that is the different thing yeah. Yeah, yeah um okay i wonder if i could jump into the movie um yeah. so uh i wanted to uh ask about your decision to make your main character um your protagonist uh, a, a a a white guy, <laughs> a, a, a white uh, German ethnologist, of course. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the eth ethnology as a as an interesting framing for the movie, um, but of course you you ch chose um, uh, to to, um, uh, to tell your story through the eyes of a European character rather than say a, a Nama or Herero character. And you've talked in other you've spoken in other interviews about how um, you you sort of didn't feel it was appropriate to tell uh, to, to to adopt say the perspective of a Nama or Herrero character as a as a European filmmaker and writer yourself. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that uh, decision making process. And I guess the reason I I hesitated to call him a, a protagonist is because he very much. In a way, he feels like he's set up to be a kind of white savior figure that we might see in um, maybe less uh, subtle <laughs> representations of uh, of colonialism through the eyes of a white character. Um, but he doesn't end up that way. Um, I, I don't think for for reasons that maybe I would I'd love to talk about in a moment. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about this character, Alexander Hoffman? Um, and why you decided to settle on this person as your um, not just main character, but as your as your perspective, as your point of view? Yes. Well, I, as you said, I thought it was not appropriate to pick one of the great um, true, uh, you know, characters, freedom fighters that would have been at hand um, at the, the first place. There is uh, on the side of the Herero, there is Jakob Morenga, who was a, a guerrilla freedom fighter um, who who gave the Germans a hard time. But even you know, even more on the side of the Nama, there was uh, Henrik Witboy, who was yeah. 
uh, who was their, their their chief. He was uh, over seventy at the time when he decided it was it was time to to launch war against the German occupation. Uh, so he and his men got on the you know on their horses as a, again over seventy years of age. And fought the Germans in a in a in a tough guerrilla war, and he died. You know, um, he died in the in this war. Mm -hmm. So th those characters, especially the the Henrik Witboy, because he, I I read the Witboy papers that they, they are published. It's you know all his writings to the German governors and right. And he, he was he, he corresponded with uh, von Trotta. Yeah, uh, he, he corresponded he corresponded that as well, and it's fascinating. It's. It is fascinating. It's such a he's such an articulate interlocutor, <laughs> right? And the Germans, you know, came so late into this uh, colonial business, and that that he knew what was going on. He knew what what colonialism and imperialism was, and he could we could study it mm -hmm. all over Africa. And he was reading the newspapers. You know, he knew what they wanted, and he knew that. And he wrote to them. You know, you won't get it. This will not work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then he, you know, and so this character. If you if you if you take if you make that film, it's the that's the underdog fighting the empire, and a great character and um, and of course I would have loved to make that movie, but um, if you know I thought it was not appropriate for a German director, um, we, you know I've been making films for twenty five years now and I have a, an access to the German funding system and 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 so on so coming with all our my possibilities and taking that great story away for some nama director or some mm -hmm. or directors or you know whoever in this country in, in next generations wants to make that movie i thought it was not right i thought germans this film well, my film was in the first place made uh, for a german audience because they as i said have this general amnesia and they don't they don't uh, know about these things, and they, so I thought it would be more from important for us at the moment to make a film that really is critical with the white um, characters of that time. But again, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I think the other film, the Henrik Wittboy film, should be done, and I mm. hope it will be done um, uh, because it would be a great film. The violence, by the way, then goes into the right direction. You know, that's. That's the underdogs fighting the German, the early Nazis. That violence works. The yes. other direction, the the violence. You know, if you if you empathize and and identify with white characters, and then you have a lot of violence. You think, wait, wait, what are we looking at here? This is terrible, yeah. because there's no justice in this direction and in, in the in the display of that violence. You know, so anyway. Um, this is why I didn't do that, and um, and I choose the the white character, and um, and yes, and then and then how do you deal with it? Yeah, that's the, and then there were I you know we shot the eighth draft, so there were drafts where uh, Hoffman was a white savior. Aha, uh -huh, okay, right, and uh, and where he you know and usually what happens in cinema when the character when the protagonist cannot save the world. At least he saves or she saves Person. the ones they love, their family. That's the second best solution that you have as a storyteller. And I thought, well, this doesn't work either because, um, as Gurley put it, um, no one came and saved us. So you know, where's where's the saving here? Mm -hmm. um, and and then we said, okay, so we can't go for this. Um, well, then there's these. There are these other stories, the the the, de the moral degeneration of characters. We have seen that, and we know what that is, and um, so that's kind of a of a genre in itself, mm -hmm. the degeneration plot. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what I went for then, and the, and and of course it g gave me the opportunity to to sh to show into the direction of the up of the dawning, you know, Third Reich and all the atrocities that would then follow, and um. Yes, um, that that was something else I wanted to say. Um, Hoffman, yeah, I forgot. Well, yeah, so that's the that's the the decision process. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder if we could uh, talk a little bit about um, the uh, the Herrero woman, Ketsia Kamba. 
Um, yeah, well, oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, because, you know, let me just jump in there right away. Kizia, that was, of course, an option to, to write a screenplay from two perspectives. Mm. Mm -hmm. his perspective and her perspective and Gurley Jazama herself is a, is a screenwriter and and a producer and a, you know she's a great filmmaker so I, I had this idea of maybe you know sharing this this process with um, Gurley and then and then you know co-writing with her but we talked it through and the problem here is that if you open both perspectives you would have as a storyteller stay to stay with her perspective throughout the story. And that would have meant we would go into that desert where 80, approximately 80,000 Herero found death um, by, um, you know, starving uh, to death. And then, and that would have meant, you know, showing shooting scenes where, where, where women left the children behind and, um, and, people were drinking the blood from their goats and all of these terrible things that happened in this desert. And of course, again, then we would have had this problem of re-traumatization, which was, of course, um, you have to see while I was writing these screenplays, this whole <clears throat> discussion about um, 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 our, you know, the, the whole discussion that followed Black Lives Matter on how we deal with racism in our days, the identity politics who tells what kind of story and so on all that grew in our mm -hmm. you know, global awareness on you know how do we deal with these stories and and so um it was very difficult to find a narrative to find a protagonist and to tell a, tell a, uh, tell a story in a way that would be appropriate not too violent but not to not denying violence either Mm -hmm. all these things you know because there are so many contradictions if you are white and you're not talking about racism you are practically a racist because you ignore it if you are um if you are um, telling a, a story of racism and you and you do not tell it from the um, victim's point of view it is also a problem mm -hmm. but if you tell it from the victim's point of view and you are not black in this case, you as uh, you know, it's it's cultural appropriation. So you're trying to understand something that you can't understand. Yeah, you try. Yeah, and it's you know, it's not mm -hmm. you're you're not in the position to tell these stories. So um, so so where in this triangle, if you talk, if you do not talk about it, you're racist. If you talk about it, you have to tell it from the victim's point of view. But if you're not a victim, you can't because it's inappropriate. So where in this triangle do you put yourself? What kind of rule are you breaking? And again, uh, having had the chance to share the screenplay process, this writing process with Gurdy would have been an option, but then we would have had a very re-traumatizing, very dark film. And, and cinema has made most of its money from exploiting violence. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't think um, that, I, I, I didn't want to make that. Sure. I, I didn't want to show these shoot these scenes in the desert. This is why we didn't do it. Sure. I mean, if, if for me at least, uh, the a lot of the sort of the, the engine of the narrative has to do with um, Alexander's interest in Kezia um, and yes. his shifting interest in her. The first as a scientific object uh, in a human zoo, um, but then he gets this sort of he gets this uh, sort of window into her inner life, into her subjectivity. And he, it's like he has this dawning realization that she's a, that she's a person, <clears throat> that she has an inner life. But at the same time, it's inscrutable to him. She's, she's not willing to give him what she wants in a way, what he wants in a way. Um, and he becomes sort of obsessed with understanding her, talking more to her, discovering more about her out of motivations that are perhaps scientific, but also something else on top. Yeah. Of. And for me, that was a really effective way of dealing with all of the sort of dilemmas that you've just been talking about, giving the sense that she is a person with a fully, um, uh, a rich and fully developed subjectivity, but also one that is not gonna simply open itself to him. Um, and um, and that that some that seems to bother him in in some way. That seems to get to him. It seems to drive him to to search for her. Um, 
I mean, that that's how I sort of read this character. Um, Absolutely. Uh, th that is uh, that has to do with this, um, <clears throat> the whole mo mo uh, motif of the ethnologist, of course, was kind of a romantic motif. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they, you know, there was kind of a, um, you know, this idea of discovering foreign, you know, look at you, it's very easy when you look at, um, at art, at the, the, exp, the German expressionism, the, 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 the painters like Nolde and so they travel to these colonial region, uh, you know, colonial areas, and they would paint the, the native, uh, um, mm. people. Or go gay in France. Yeah. 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 Like the French had that too. And then, and, and of course, you know, left and right on the of these canvases, there was these atrocities happening. You know, mm -hmm. women raped, and yet they would only draw, you know, the 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 the, the naked bathing, uh, you mm -hmm. know, sure. yeah. these people. And so, so, so this is kind of the false um, romanticism of these people of that time, um, and and that is part of Hoffman too. He yes, the, he's part of this academic discussion that we talked about earlier. But then he meets this this woman, and and he's in this age in in this age where his mother, who thinks he's he's no good and he's very naive and he will not be very successful in his life, she wants to get him married to a rich woman, and he does. He wants something bigger. He wants mm -hmm. you know, he wants true romance. He wants adventure, and he or wants whatever that means. Yeah, he wants something else. And then he meets Kazia, and he and he falls in love. Mm -hmm. And he's and he's in the position, in this powerful position, to touch her longer than you know. He, he can be in in this first encounter, which is I think the most horrible scene of the film to a certain degree, when he measures her head and she's crying, which was an uh, which was a, a, a interesting day of shooting because Gurley could you know she, I think she's not playing in that scene. I think she's acting out. The trauma of her, you know, mother, grandmother, and and all of the women in her family, because she was crying for hours yeah. in that scene. Okay. Um, and and when he's and and what happens there is basically this this false uh, romanticism that he's following. And and you're right, it, it also plays with the expectance of the audience in the cinema that these kind of characters will find a way of saving those people they love and. And then, and then he doesn't do that in the end. Right. So, yes. uh, so there. But of course, it also uh, there is a kind of horror to to a certain part of the audience. We had a big discussion in the audience, especially with Afro German audience, who said because they were so scared that it would be a white savior kind of character, and they were forced to empathize with this guy who's, you know, on the other hand, um, um brave enough to challenge the academic world uh, on this grounds of this woman is smart and she is just like us and she you know that is giving him such a hard time that of course people get in this dilemma he's something in in his to a certain degree they see a man who is um who is um crossing a border sexually harassing already a, 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 to a certain degree harming a woman and and obsessive and on the other hand he is fighting for something that we all think is good mm -hmm. so sure. so this dilemma put people in germany in the in the cinema to a very uncomfortable position they would say you know why and why do i have to watch this and why is this character i'm empathetic but then again i hate him and so mm -hmm. i think this is very important for cinema you know the because we were talking about the great Martin Scorsese earlier. I mean, when you look at the um, at the American independent movie making of the seventies, th those characters that these, especially Martin Scorsese, had in his cinema were so ambivalent and yeah. and so asking you for so much emotionally. I think that you know that is very important for cinema that you have that kind of sure. Of, sure dualism and you know good and evil in those characters otherwise you know why go to the movies that's right yeah um now we're running short on time but i wonder if we i could ask one more follow-up question that could bring us to the end of the movie um so uh, there's an amazingly powerful scene right at the end 
where um, Alexander finds Kezia. Um, and she is preparing uh, uh, the, the the body of one of her people to be sent back to as a specimen to Germany. Um, and it was a, you know, you've talked about av avoiding violence. This was a sort of, uh, or, or at least um, uh, uh, sparing it or, or, or keeping it for this particular moment, which I thought was quite powerful. Um, and it's also the moment where uh, Alexander, you know, he finds what he's been looking for the whole movie, but he seems to lose his nerve. He, ru he runs away. Um, and for me, the scene was sort of interesting on a thematic level because you really see the uh, uh, racist pseudoscience and its relationship to colonialism coming together, right? It's almost like the concentration camp is a factory for producing specimens for the labs back home. But it's also the, the key point for this character, right? He's been searching for the whole movie and he finds what he's been looking for and he seems to lose his nerve. He runs away. So I wonder if in the two or three minutes, I know it's a lot to ask, in the two or three minutes we have remaining, if you could just reflect on that moment a little bit and what, what it meant for you. Well, let me share something on the, the what you saw as the eighth draft on the seventh draft. <laughs> The, the he wouldn't even find Kizia mm. in that, sh in that sh Shark Island skull barrack, mm -hmm. but he had her, but he was so obsessed with her and he followed mm -hmm. her and so and he would only have um, her the measures of her head mm. on a you know, his notebook and from all these skulls that were there he was looking for her because he knew she might be a, one of these specimens. And and he was ending the final image was him in in he was uh, he had gone crazy you know he was uh, so, yeah I don't know how you say it in English he was mad but madness which is uh, um, a strong image that um, people like Rudyard Kipling or Joseph Conrad had used in their novels a lot uh, as an as a, as a symbol for uh, colonialism. Madness is a, is is a, is a disease. You know, you're sick, you're ill, and you know if you're if you if you've gone mad, you're. And that is not that is. I don't think that is what happened to all the colonialists. You know, I think they made they made their decisions. And what the Europeans always did in these colonial areas is they they raised hell, and then when when the when when it was there, they just turned around and went back home. You know, and so this is what we are still witnessing that's happening in Africa all, still all the time. We have created all these problems, not all of them, but the major problems we have created in 1885 at the German Congo Conference in Berlin. That's when the when the frontiers were drawn and when all these conflicts were created that are still going on today. And Europe just, you know, just looks at it and says, yeah. What can we do about it? You know, yeah, exactly. so uh, um, I think um, I think this is why I changed this final uh, sequence to what you saw in the movie um, and what it is now. And I think it's the that's the symbol for what Europeans have created: created hell in Africa and then turned around and yeah. went home and told their lies. But uh, Kezia gets to watch him do that, at least, which is which was a was a powerful touch for me. Uh, she gets to sort of have a moment where, at least, written on her face, at least, there's some sort of surprise yeah. judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She has she's she knows what he is up for. That's right. There was even a dialogue. She there was a long dialogue of the two of them meeting in front of that uh, barrack, and and you know, but there was really nothing he could say. And she would she would know that he was in this that he was part of these of this terror and 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 then the editor just took it out a beautifully acted dialogue he just took it out and he said he showed it to me one day and I said yeah you're right it's much more powerful without words and this this moment that he denies her and turns mm -hmm. around and runs away she knows that he was there and she there's this glimpse she realizes yeah. there was Hoffman maybe. Yeah, but um, Hoffman, you know, Hoffman means um, something like it, it. It sounds like hope in Germany. It's Hoffman is uh, it's the person of hope, it's which he's not in the end. <laughs> oh wow! Well, I would have loved to have chatted longer about this movie. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank but you very much. We're running short on time, so thank you so much for chatting with me today, Lars. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you and, for your uh, help.
thank you for for screening the film at the festival i wish i could be there um and uh, yeah have a good time have a good you know a good uh, talks to about all the other films and maybe next time we can meet in person thank you so much lars take care bye Sean.